great to talk about these sorts of topics, um, in particular after the first, uh, the first two speakers. So um, I really didn't know quite what was expected, so I kind of had an idea that I would give some examples of energy transfer in, in coming out of our work, coming out of our experimental results and things that we published recently, that really embodied sort of the sort of the title of the conference, the view of the Commons, the Amos scale, Mesoscale, scale, macro scale. Um, and everything we do is related to plasmonics and nanoplatonics. So plasmonics is a platform through which we can look at coupling, uh, look at energy transfer, energy coupling at different scales. But, um, but then Marx started talking and I got all confused and, and uh, he said I was going to talk about cancer therapy, so I'll throw that in. <laughs> 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 I wasn't going to do that. Um, but uh, I wanted to also, uh, based on some of the questions and sort of gauging the audience, I, I, I added a few things. So I apologize if this is a little chaos. I had some ideas of, 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 of maybe extending this to some chemical systems. And so I have some things here for chemists, and I also have some things here for um, to, to stick with the major theme of plasmonics. Um, uh, in particular, I want to talk about our picture for uh, for understanding plasmons, or and I think this is very important for energy transfer, understanding interacting plasmons, both as a way to understand the fundamental resonances of complex nanostructures, but also interacting structures. And we'll extend this from localized plasmons, say on one complex localized nanoparticle, several resonances, and interpreting those understanding those to a system where a nano where, where a localized plasmonic nanoparticle interacts with a mesoscopic or macroscopic structure like a thin film or a wire. So we'll talk about the hybridization that occurs in the plasmonic states between localized and propagated plasmons near the end of my talk. Um, I want to so 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 to get there I will talk a little bit about plasmonic nanoparticles that I of, of my own work localized uh, localized nanoparticles with interacting plasmons, and uh, we use them, it turns out, for surface enhanced spectroscopy, so I'm going to give some examples. One that I thought was kind of neat, it's something that the chemists will find interesting, something new, learning something new about an alkane thiol self-assembled monolayer, which is like saying learning something new about the hydrogen atom. Many people, something that's been published for you know, 3,000 papers on, on alkane thiols at least, and, but we, we, we've discovered something interesting by, by, as a result of having constructed plasmonic substrates for surfacing and spectroscopies, and also extending this, there's also some comments earlier, um, in, uh, earlier this morning about scaling, about extending uh, plasmon, uh, plasmon properties to other light scales and how they, that, that one can do this easily, moving to, of course, as we all know, surface plasmons go down to a frequency of zero. So we can actually scale plasmonics down to longer wavelengths. And that's appropriate, actually, in, in achieving other spectroscopies, like surface enhanced infrared. So I'll show you some of our first results there. Um, something briefly about how, uh, how plasmonic nanoparticles can actually act as nano antennas. And first, in fact, that's kind of the sort of theme of the latter, latter part of my talk, and um, first, how a plasmon can, um, uh, how, how a, a plasmonic nanoparticle, of course, acts as a standard dipole antenna. You don't have to build a dipole antenna. It doesn't have to look like an antenna, okay? right? That's kind of crazy. It's so small. It's a sphere. It's a perfect antenna. <laughs> but how we can couple this in, a, in an intelligent way, in a systematic way, to molecules to then um, enhance the quantum yield of the molecule. How is that done? Um, how large does that have to be in the context of a particular experiment, and uh, what are the important parameters in the basically a, a plasmonic antenna uh, uh, delivering molecular fluorescence into the far field. And then uh, finally, as I mentioned before, some interesting um, the, uh, the, the, the interaction between localized and propagating plasmons, and that's also interesting since it's a prototype for. Um, for, for, for um, actually the Anderson model begins to emerge in the si these systems, and um, I know that's tantalizing enough for some of you, so I'll leave that for later in the talk. Thank you, Mark. I don't have to talk about plasmons as an oscillation of, of electrons and so on, and I also don't have to mention that, um, as we know, that of course plasmons are, are shape dependent as well as uh, metal dependent resonances. The resonances are important because. It is at the resonances of the, the characteristic resonances of the structure that we can achieve high fields. So it's important to know what the, what the resonant energies are for any particular nanostructure. And um, 
the work that we have that's been the, the, the geometry that's been the basis of a lot of our work is a very practical geometry, which is out of a hollow shell, which has two interacting plasmons: uh, uh, the pla surface plasmon that propagates on the outside of the shell, and the surface plasmon that propagates on the inside of the shell. The structure is a highly tunable has a highly tunable plasmon resonance and uh, is relatively straightforward to make. And this is a highly tunable plasmon resonance that extends from the visible region across the mid infrared the whole way up to approximately the far infrared uh, in, far infrared region. So uh, this is an interesting, very interesting and, and very practical geometry to work with and trying to understand why that's such a tunable plasmon uh, led us to a very interesting idea, which is really a paradigm. I mean, it's an observation, excuse me, it's an observation it's very powerful and important as, uh, as far as I'm concerned for understanding anything having to do with plasmons, localized or, or otherwise. And the basic idea is that collective electronic resonances mix and hybridize exactly the same way that wave functions do in simple atoms and molecules. And that's actually as rigorous the equations that describe, describe this uh, interaction uh, are isomorphic to the Schrodinger equation. And so uh, bonding and anti-bonding orbitals that would result from a simple uh, formation of a, of a uh, of, of, a, of a diatomic molecule are directly uh, are, 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 are directly uh, in parallel with the uh, mixing of plasmons from, for example, in order to make, for example, a nanoshell, a constant uh, frequency sphere, a constant frequency cavity plasmons. They're constant frequency or constant energy in the quasi-static limit. And then um, to mix, to, as, as they, they're combined into a hollow shell structure, they mix and hybridize and form bonding and anti-bonding, of course the name's derivative from the molecular systems, bonding and anti-bonding uh, plasmons. An idea that actually was around since the early 1980s. Orian Matthew did beautiful work with interacting particles, particles over the surface. And, he, and you'll find in the literature references even to bonding and antibody plasmons. But it wasn't until we really had this very simple geometry that really the formalism for why this is actually a general principle that can be applied to all plasmonic systems uh, really began to began to emerge. So this explains why plasmons are tunable from a physical point of view. Of course, you can solve Maxwell's equations and get out the resonance of a structure like this as a function of the inner outer radius of the sphere. But the physical picture results from the hybridization of the plasmon, surface plasmon on the outside and the surface plasmon in the inside of the structure. If the, if the shell is very thick, then of course the coupling between these two plasmons is very, very weak. And the splitting between the bonding and antibonding plasmons is very small. And if the shell is very thin, the splitting is very large, as shown here. And so this illustrates the basic trend that, that's, uh, that, that's observed and can be calculated by other methods that are not necessarily as physically transparent. And that is that as one goes to thinner and thinner shells, then one gets uh, uh, lower and lower plasmon energies. And it turns out only this plasmon uh, energy, only this plasmon mode, is, couples well to light. And so this is called the bright plasmon, and this is called the dark plasmon. And these are all realizable experimentally. So this is not just purely theory. This is something we've been working with really for uh, on the order of approximately 10 years where we can make a nanoparticle, and then each particle gives rise to a spectrum. This is, in every case, a single particle spectrum fit with theory, uh, with no adjustable parameters and with no uh, adjust adjustments due to surface electron scattering. Um, and we get very, very nice agreement between the resonance predicted, resonance observed, and the structure that gives plasmonic structure that gives rise to that to that resonance. <coughs> so. There are whole, so this is a very general idea. Well, in fact, that's sort of the cha next challenge. If this is a general idea, we should be able to apply it to a whole bunch of different geometries and see um, plasmonic resonances that, are, that, 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 that we can calculate, that can be calculated using this method, but also that just can be intuitively understood uh, from this method. And so we've actually, in the last several years, looked at all of these structures, and we just, just this past January, we wrote it. Um, published a, a, a review in accounts of chemical research entitled Plasmonic Nanoparticles Artificial Molecules that really illustrates how this, um, how, how one can apply the principles of plasma hybridization to all of these different diverse sorts of uh, nanostructures as well as meso and macro uh, extending structures. So, uh, um, so this is, and, and of course this gives rise to applications, I won't mention, mention that, but I do want to mention, I'll mention that later of course, 
I do want to mention uh, one particular, uh, particularly conceptually uh, straightforward variation of a simple, of the simple spherical structure that shows you how plasmon hybridization works. Because trying to understand, trying to understand the plasmon residence of, of, of a spherically symmetric structure, that's easy. Okay, that's nice and clean and so on. Bonding and anti-bonding plasmons. If we then break symmetry, okay, we have a different problem altogether. And so, but, but it turns out we can apply plasmon <coughs> hybridization to a structure like this just based on what we understand about the simple nanoshell spherical resonance and, uh, and, and, and this serves as a very good illustration. In fact, it's really the only way to understand the resonances of a nanoway. And, um, and, 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 and it gives it, so, so, so it very much supports this basic approach to understanding this idea. So <coughs> again, if we start with, so a nanoshell has uh, two hybridized plasmons, bonding and anti-bonding plasmons. And if we were going to speak a little bit more generally, then each of the parent plasmons, the sphere plasmon and the cavity plasmon, actually has a whole angle, a whole, whole angular momentum dependent family, right? Dipole, quadrupole, etc. plasmons for the sphere, and the plasmons for the cavity. And all of these would mix and hybridize. But because of the spherical symmetry, there's a selection rule. So only the dipole state mixes with the dipole state, water pole, water pole, et cetera. And if we break symmetry, then the selection rules are, of course, relaxed. And so we don't have, so, so rather than just having the dipole state of the sphere mixing with the dipole state of the plasma, of the, of the cavity plasma, excuse me, we have instead of an extra mixing, we now have additional mixing to the <coughs> entire manifold of the cavity plasma states. And so we can, uh, if we make a, make a nanoshell and then slowly introduce an asymmetry to the structure, we can in fact look at how this, uh, how, how this uh, symmetry breaking turns on. And of course, just by looking at this, we realize right away we can see profound changes in the, in the structure. And we can see this experimentally as well as theoretically. So here we have either a nanoshell where you can just deposit a little bit more metal on one side. They're not pretty, but their spectra are really quite nice. This is a, this is a, 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 spare, a nanoshell bonding, anti-bonding plasmon. And then as we just introduce more and more, these are just a different nanoshells of varying, uh, nano eggs, excuse me, of varying, we're increasing uh, eccentricities. Okay, we see that we have additional resonances that turn on, and we also see that the anti-bonding peak, which was very, very weak, almost not allowed, now becomes very strong. And we see the same type of behavior when we look uh, at, the, at the theoretically obtained uh, resonances for this structure. Sorry, what would the absorption be? We are looking, actually, this is scattering. So um, th these are the extinction spectra for a part of the quasi static limit, so that's absorption only. But these, the measurements are actually in the scattering. And, it, and it's, it's, it's not single particle, it's a collection of particles? No, it's a single particle it measurement, yeah. excuse me. These are individual, individual spectra. <coughs> Just as I showed you before for the shell, these are individual spectra for, for just selected eggs. And luckily, there's, um, these were just randomly distributed on, on a surface, and uh, there's virtually very little polarization of eggs to uh, this asymmetry, so uh, that was fine. So this is another thing that people mention. There's a, a huge interest, of course, in this field in obtaining very, very large intensities, and so people want to make very sharp, pointy structures. Pointy structures with high intensities tend to melt unless they're very carefully prepared. But that's not the only way to make a very high field. Okay? We can begin to think about uh, interacting plasmons and design a structure where the plasmons interact uh, maximally over a, a small region of the structure, as shown here in this, uh, as the, this, this progression from a nanoshell to a nano egg. And we see the field enhancements go up. And we also see the field enhancements localized here in the region of strongest interaction between the the, the, the sphere and cavity plasmons of this, uh, plasma manifolds of this structure. So this is a, a very interesting geometry because it also shows you that large fields can be, can, can be, uh, can, can be designed onto open surfaces of a nanoparticle and not, not, not trapped inside of junctions of nanoparticles. That works too, that works beautifully, but there's now also other ways to, uh, other ways to, 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 <coughs> to, to create very large fields. Yes. Is there a problem in your nanoshells if there is a hole when you kind of move your part to one side? There's a hole? Yes, uh, uh, not completely covered metal. 
No, and we have studied that extensively. Okay, we've done a lot of studies. We probably have we, we probably have about ten papers, both theoretical and experimental, okay, looking at the effects of surface roughness systematically and the effects of defects. Okay, so if you have a particle and you start with a perfect smooth shell and you begin to introduce surface roughness, um, the the surface plasma is remarkably robust to surface surface roughness. The only way you can really destroy that plasma is by making an actual fissure. Okay, so you don't you stop the propagation of the surface wave of the structure. What would happen if you do introduce surface roughness is you have higher order modes like quadrupole, optical, or whatever. Those would be damped, but the actual the fundamental mode, the dipole plasmon, is it, it is it's very is extra, extremely robust and it's very hard to destroy that unless you fundamentally change the the you know fundament, fundament, fundamentally forbid the surface plasma. I guess what to think of it. <coughs> so. Uh, so, so, so this is certainly an approach for building substrates for surface <coughs> spectroscopy. This is a field that, as Mark alluded to, many people have done some really very nice work, um, sometimes fortuitous, uh, and, sometimes, uh, and, and sometimes by design, for example, making sharp uh, structures. And so there, is, there are some really tantalizing and exciting advances in this area, and this all, all, all of which are, of course, <coughs> mediated by plasmons, in addition to, or if there are chemical effects, we're not going to worry about that. We're only going to worry about um, controlling the electromagnetic um, aspects as, as well as we can. So we can do that well with, with nano shell plasmons as well by tuning the plasmon resonance to the excitation laser of the. Um, that we can excite SIRS and we have molecules on the surfaces of the nano shells, and we get beautiful, um, beautiful enhancements on the order of about uh, approximately 10, 10 to the 8 enhancements. Um, for, for something like this at the, at the laser wavelength that we would like. This is all in, in the near infrared, but because this is a tunable structure, we can tune this plasma and get out SIRS wherever we would like. So actually, um, uh, in the context of SIRS, in the context of SIRS measurements, we recently did a really quantitative study where we just compared nanoshells to dimers head on um, in uh, single particle SIRS. Com combining that also with some calculations to see if we could really quantify and be really be as, be as, be as quantifiable and rigorous as possible and compare what the relative magnitudes are of, say, a nanoshell covered with a Raman active molecule versus a dimer covered with a Raman active molecule. The dimer, which will, of course, give rise to a much larger field in, the, in, in its junction on resonance um, over a much smaller um, uh, surface area. So, of course, this is the this is the geometry that gives rise to the hot spot that Mark uh, mentioned earlier this morning, and uh, which also gave rise to an, an, an entire sort of renaissance in this field due to Patrick Keefe and, and the work that where people d uh, d discovered single molecule sensitivity for SIRS uh, because because certain molecules were then found in the junctions uh, in, in, or, or in, the, in the hot spots of the junction plasmon. So we can think of a, a junction or a dimer, right, in the um, in the plasma hybridization picture. Right? Whereas two particles are brought in close proximity to each other, so unlike a nanoshell that has two plasmons interacting but on two sides of the structure, here we just have two plasmons on adjacent structures interacting. And regardless of where the two interacting plasmons are, this is where the largest induced dipole moments are going to be and where the largest fields are going to be. So this dimer plasmon, bonding plasmon, gives rise to the, to the hot spots. <coughs> so if we just take, if, if, we take if we take those solid particles, coat them with a Raman active molecule, throw them on the surface, we find that we see hot spots, and we only see hot spots where we see dimers. Um, if we do the same thing with, with nanoshells, we see that we see a whole lot of hot spots, and sometimes the hot spots are, many times, most of the time, the hot spots are, are single particles, and uh, the hot spots are also, can be dimers and nanoshells. <coughs> and if we go through and and very systematically calculate the local fields exactly what we would expect. The field enhancement, U to 4, um, on the surface of the particle, uh, uh, surface average, because everything is coated with a monolayer of, of molecules, and we actually compare uh, the experimental counts to what we can obtain theoretically. We can even test for roughness to see if roughness is important, as shown here. So this was an FETD simulation that matched a, 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 a me scattering calculation. Uh, and if we compare the two, we find that, in fact, dimers win, but not by a whole lot. So if you look at the actual surface average signal, then you find that, that yes, this is a much larger field, but over the surface average, we have a lower field, larger surface area, and it's about a strong, uh, about a factor of 10 smaller in strength 
than, than or less actually than, um, uh, less of a difference than, than, than a dimer. So there's a quanti well, one can begin to be quantitative about this. But then, as I said before, these all of these sorts of geometries do scale. So we can take exactly this idea of a dimer plasmon, bringing these two solid particles together, they have a resonance at 2.3 electron volts, and introduce a near IR junction plasmon. Why don't we start with particles that have a resonance in, in the near IR, bring the particles together and make mid-IR resonances and see if we can use that for spectroscopy. Of course, that's a different spectroscopy. The kind of spectroscopy one would be able to do there would be a direct infrared excitation of, um, of the vibrational modes of a molecule. So if, if we instead of take, take solid particles, if we take uh, near infrared, the, these are the nanoshells we started with are a little bit larger, so their dimer resonance is, is around 1.3 microns. And if we begin to bring them together and then we get a, a larger uh, a larger peak here, okay, that's out in the beginning to approach the mid IR. I'll show you a little bit more about this, and all because of the, the, the plasmon hybridization. And if we have a Raman active molecule, the same molecule we use for serves, if, if we have this coating our nanoshells and we find that we get some beautiful surface enhanced infrared, this is actually the first spectrum we ever got, and we were kind of stunned because it was the first spec, it was a whole spectrum um, of this molecule, surface enhanced infrared compared to the bulk. Okay, all of the all of the, the resonances are there. Of course, the resonances that we see for Sarah have this characteristic, very strongly asymmetric line shape, which has been uh, which is, has been previously um, uh, studied uh, theoretically quite quite extensively, actually. Um, and so we can see that that whole scales very nicely. But if we look carefully at what plasmonically what's going on, um, if we start from the um, just let's start from the optical. Spectrum. This is all theory. theory. This is uh, find a difference time domain. We start from a, a single data shell, then we start actually with a, di a dipole resonance, and then a little higher order quadrupole resonance. So let's look at what happens as hybridization begins to happen with the nearest neighbor structures. If I go from a single data shell to a trimer data shell, then the dipole plasmons begin to interact, and I get a broader, significantly redshifted. Uh, di dipole, excuse me, dipole derived uh, redshifted plasmon, and my quadrupole plasmon stays at the same uh, wavelength that it, it was before. It shifts, but just a few, just a few nanometers, barely shifts. If I extend this to an entire array, then I find that in fact the, di the dipole plasmon then mixes and disperses uh, really dramatically down into a band, leaving then also the quadrupole. Uh, plasmon here back at its original wavelength. <laughs> and if I look at um, if I look at the at, at the actual aggregate that I used in the experiments that I just showed you, you can see that I have a few dimers, but I actually have a large a lot of larger aggregate structures. So the larger aggregate supports this much broader infrared band. And this is the actual experimental spectrum of, of all of this whole ensemble of things. But you can see that we have a large um, a large amount of low wavelength, like broader wavelength, mid IR. Um, uh, resonance, and so, um, so, so, so this actually is what gives rise to that entire spectrum that I showed you earlier. However, this is a very, very interesting uh, spectrum because what it says to me is we can get greedy, actually. Okay, let me go back for a second. And we can actually think about taking a, 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 a substrate like this, that looks just like this. This ought to support SARA, it ought to support infrared, and you know it ought to support SIRS at the same time. So can we combine SIRS it Raman and infrared all on the same substrate. And um, that's that's actually something I think chemists would love to do because they've been doing Raman plus infrared for a long time. Just doing infrared just or just Raman is not as interesting if one wants to, to, to analyze unknowns. And so 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 we did just that. We took a took a, a nanoshell coated with a surfactant and then made these very nice ordered arrays. The surfactant is essential because it provides a, a spacing of less than 10 nanometers between each particle. So we have a hotspot designed into this nanostructure, in, into these nanostructure arrays. So they have the right structure in the mesoscale, and then they also have this long, uh, this, this periodicity as shown here. And if we just look at the experimental spectrum, we have a <coughs> single particle spectrum here, and then these are the array spectrum. So there's a very large resonance, very, very broad mid IR resonance begins to form as soon as we take that same particle and, and uh, extend it into an array. <coughs> so if we look at um, if, if we look at this in, in, with respect to SIRS, okay, so if I want to do SIRS uh, at say 785 pump laser wavelength, these are my field enhancements. 
if I want to do, then do surface enhanced infrared, okay, I want to do this in the mid IR, the same exact structure supports very strong local fields. Again, they're all have migrated to the, ju to the junctions in these structures, but they're in identically the same regions of the structures, and they hold up. Uh, there are some symmetry arguments that show that this actually holds uh, independent of, 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 of symmetry in this array. But we see that we have very strong resonances both in the near IR and a very, very broad but strong resonance in the mid IR, sufficient to give rise to some beautiful uh, SIRS spectra. Here we have an enhancement larger by about an order of magnitude than what we saw with isolated nanoshells. So this now puts us into the region of, of, of what we can see with dimers. But then we also can do, we can also do infrared. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, how does the spacer that you have there interact with the molecule that you're trying to put on, you're trying to analyze, you would imagine that, first of all, the space molecule itself may be either infrared or sir or raw or both active, and it might chemically react or obscure other molecules that are actually getting on the particles. In the Absolutely. Door. Absolutely. So what happens is the, the, the molecule, the, the spatial molecule is bound weakly. It's bound with a bromine, and we can actually displace it if we come in with any Thiol, we can displace it, but by displacing that spacer molecule with a smaller Raman active molecule, we don't change the periodicity of the arrays. Because once they're down on a substrate, the strongest forces are between the particles and the substrate. And so the inner, the, the inner particle forces are not, uh, they're not destabilized by removing that surfactant. So that's a very good question, and, and that was, it was very exciting because we could actually watch the CTAB come off, and watch the surge come on, watch the, the thiol come on. And this shows, um, actually uh, so the Sarah spectra that we can get with enhancements that really kind of knock us out. We still don't really understand why we're seeing enhancements that are almost, that are several times 10 to the fifth um, across for all the major modes of this molecule. So it's something that we're, we're really very excited about and now we're doing a lot of infrared spectroscopy with plasmons. So, um, so as I said, it's, all, it's always exciting if you build some sort of platform like that. You know, it's nice, sort of nice to be a builder. It's also interesting to discover things, right? Nothing kind of beats seeing something bizarre in the laboratory that you, that you don't understand. And so we actually did a measurement that, um, that, that, that was very exciting because it solved a, an old mystery um, that has been plaguing chemists actually ever since theorists began to look at surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. <clears throat> so if you ask someone who, quantum chemist, to calculate a surface enhanced Raman spectrum, they'll get all the modes correct within a wave number or two. I mean, they're very, very good in agreement primarily, unless there's some, something unusual about the system, except for one mode, and that mode is the metal sulfur bond, right? The bond that attaches the molecule to the metal itself. Okay, so I'm only talking about those sorts of systems. And so if you have a gold sulfur stretch or a silver sulfur stretch, um, all of your spectrum will be perfect, except that one mode, and that mode will be off by a lot, and it will be off by 30 or 40 wave numbers, Red, it'll be blue, who knows? Nobody understood. And, and so there's a, a, always been sort of a strange, uh, you know, strange murmurings about gold sulfur stretch and silver sulfur stretch. And of course, well, we're not modeling the surface adequately. That's why this never works out. But it never seems to work out. And so that was a very interesting uh, 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 lore of this, of this field. So, but it turns out if we, in this, on these very regular substrates that now we're making, we now make alkane thiol, self assembled monolayers, now a very regular, uh, regular surface layer, and then we do surface enhanced raw scattering on these SAMs. We found, we discovered something new that people hadn't actually looked at before. So, for, for those, so, so this is sort of the standard, you know, physicist view of an alkane thiol molecule. So, the sulfur, sulfur uh, atom binds this linear chain to the surface, and there's a uh, packing energy that, that preserves the order in these essentially 2D crystalline uh, uh, self-assembled uh, structures. And uh, if we look at these structures as a function of carbon chain length, we observe something very unusual. The, the, the mode typically attributed to the gold sulfur stretch has a, has a beautiful and very systematic mass dependence. So we thought that was quite interesting. How can that have a mass dependence? Right, so this is this is here. So not only does it have a mass dependence, but we can also see these other interesting kind of almost like overtone modes that begin to also appear if one takes these in the spectra very, very carefully, all down in this low re the frequency region of the spectrum, very systematic and very reproducible. <laughs> and it turns out that these are actually, um, people have known for a long time that you just take 
the, these um, alkane chain molecules in solution that they don't have accordion modes. They have longitudinal acoustic modes. Okay? And they have well-defined Raman frequencies that vary with the number of carbon atoms, right? well, well-defined selection rules. If I then take that carbon chain and I tether it to a surface, I break the selection, I relax the selection rules, and so all of them become weakly Raman active. And it turns out that they all, um, that, 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 they, that they all now, um, they're not only all allowed, but the gold sulfur stretch now couples to the chain, couples to this longitudinal acoustic mode. And we can understand this in a very simple physical way because the gold sulfur stretch is the most polarizable bond in the molecule. So if we think about this as a slinky, we excite that gold sulfur stretch, and of course it's going to couple to that slinky that's hanging off the end of it, and that's going to um, modulate its resonant frequency. And so this, is, this shows that the, the several of the lamb K modes um, of, that are supported by an alkane chain, and these are the, of course, that of corresponds to the number of nodes of the molecule. These are the longitudinal displacements. This is all the 1D model. Um, but if we then take a 1D model that couples the lamb K modes to the gold sulfur stretch and compare this to the, to, to the progression we saw in experimental, we have a really beautiful agreement with uh, why this mass dependence really is there. So in a simple 1D system, we can actually see that um, that the actual mo molecule molecular motion couples in very cleanly to the gold sulfur stretch. That's undoubtedly a general mechanism that should have some uh, effect on virtually any molecule bound um, uh, bound to bound to the uh, metal. So if we can uh, leave leave SIRS and look at another uh, interesting aspect of molecular uh, photophysics. It has to do with how a plasmon, um, how, how plasmonic nanostructure might be used to enhance um, the fluorescence of an adjacent molecule. And I just give an example, a sort of real-world example here. This is a, 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 a series of images of, of, of an eyeball. Um, there's a molecule. This is not. I don't want to talk about that. It's gruesome. Um, but anyway, there's a, there, there's a, a, a near infrared uh, dye that's used universally in medical imaging called endocyanine green. It is in the, um, it, it emits in the near infrared. It's ubiquitous because um, in this region of the spectrum, um, the, uh, light penetrates of, of set to, light penetrates almost 10 centimeters through tissue, and that's very important. Um, but it's also the only FDA approved um, fluorophore. So it, it's non-toxic at concentrations that can be used. All molecular fluorophores are toxic at certain concentrations, but this is this is non-toxic enough for most of us to be used. If you've ever had cardiac imaging, the, this is also called cardio green, so it's uh, you used extensively in cardiac imaging. Well, this molecule has, as I said, it's, it's toxic at high concentrations, like all molecular uh, uh, fluorescent species, um, uh, and it has a very low quantum yield. But it's sort of the, it's around just a little bit above one percent. But but it is. Um, it, 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 is, it is the best that one can do. And so we thought, is there a way that we could now use, uh, use the plasmon to somehow enhance the quantum yield of a fluorophore? So to think about this in a systematic way, of course, in free space fluorescence, we have radiative, we have quantum yield that's, that's controlled by radiative and non-radiative uh, 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 decay rates. And if we introduce, for example, the near field, okay, the near field was likely to quench the nanoparticle. Uh, but uh, uh, but a, a, a plasmon, plasmonic structure that is uh, located close enough, or far enough away that it won't quench the uh, plasmon, but will in fact uh, capture the emitting light, is actually likely to modify the radiative rate, or change the, the enhance the radiative rate of the molecule. If you enhance the radiative rate, it turns out that you will increase the quantum yield of the fluorophore. And so we took nanoshells and we presented these molecules near the surface of the, of the nanoparticle. Um, we are basically keeping, we're not varying the distance. Okay? We're just keeping them far enough away that they won't quench. What we are varying is the plasmon resonant energy. We're tuning the antenna that's going to capture the fluorescence and then deliver that fluorescence to the far field. It's literally a nano antenna problem. So we'll show you how this works. So we have so 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 our our, our, nano, our our fluorescent molecules are here. They're separated by a spacer layer so that they do not quench. And then we tune the resonance. We build a whole lot of samples where we can tune the resonance of the actual nanoparticle. Um, and we tune towards, for example, the laser the the, this is the laser excitation wavelength of the fluorophore. And this is the emission wavelength of this fluorophore endocyanin green. 
And if we begin to, so this is now the fluorescence intensity, and here we're tuning the plasma on energy towards the uh, appropriate energetics of the molecule. So if we tune towards the emission wavelength, we see that, that, that we get uh, an increase in fluorescence, and as we begin to come toward, if we tune to the laser excitation wavelength, we have an a, a greater fluorescence. And if we tune to the emission wavelength, this is where we have by far the greatest enhancements. These, this is not noise here, this is actually the resonance raman of the molecule, so it's interacting very strongly with, uh, with, with, with the nanoshell, even though it's uh, several nanometers away. And uh, we can tune further and we see then a decrease in the enhancement. So the plasma resonance energy clearly has a very strong effect, and the maximal effect that we see is tuned specifically to the emission wavelength of the fluorophore itself. And in a simple geometry like a nanoshell, you can actually calculate the radiative rate enhancement um, that a nearby molecule would, would, would experience um, as one changed the core and shell of the structure. And we find that, the, that, that in fact, theoretically, we can obtain the same result that the emission wavelength should correspond to the greatest uh, change in radiative, uh, in, in, in radiative, uh, increasing radiative uh, rate. And, um, but we also see that that's not the entire story, that there's also a size dependence due to the, the, the absorption versus scattering of the individual uh, nanoparticles. So this is, of the, of the structures we worked with, we had, so we had we worked with structures of <coughs> nanoparticles of different absolute sizes. We saw that as the particles were larger, for absolute size, that we had, in fact, a much larger, um, a, a much larger fluorescence enhancement. Um, and so one, so, so, so one, um, a, a sort of another example of how this structure can influence the uh, emission of a fluorophore, if we take the entire structure, the nanoparticle, the molecules around it, okay? And this is the, the sequence shown here. Okay, so for all of these nanoparticles plus uh, emitting molecules, these are the, the resonances here that correspond to these three spectra, okay? This one here is maximal because it's too closest to the emission wavelength, and these now are at higher energies, okay? And they have a little bit less fluorescence. If they take that entire sample as it has this the same fluorescence emission enhancement uh, in air, and then I just change the uh, solvent refractive index. What I do is I shift all of these to much much long, lower energies, much longer wavelengths. So I can just by sticking the thing in water, I tune the uh, I, I tune this resonance far away from the emission wavelength, and I bring the next. Uh, the, the next uh, uh, resonant nanoparticle much closer to the emission wavelength. And so these, uh, this, so this is the result of that type of tuning. What used to be my maximum e emission now is much, much less. And what used to, the next guy on, in line here um, is now tuned to maximum emission. So this one also has a, um, has, has, has a very strong, uh, uh, has the strongest emission wavelength. So I want to, con I, I want to extend this now to Discussing the, um, you know, how we can apply. Yes, yes, you can. That's very, that's a very boring, uh, a, a very boring video. So how we, how we can apply the plasmon hybridization to understand particles, uh, the localized plasmons of particles coupling to uh, propagating plasmons on extended surfaces. And here, this is sort of the trivial non-case where I just shine light into the, on a flat surface. Of course, I'm not going to excite a plasma in that way. Everybody knows that. So my simulation is quite boring. But if I have a coupled particle, coupled particle film system, then I see that the interaction between the particle and the film then give rise to quite significant uh, propagating plasmons that originate at this um, localized, at this essentially uh, uh, defect, which introduces the field onto the surface. What's, what's the length scale? Oh, that's a very, very good question. The length scale is probably on the order of about um, 100, maybe about 200 nanometers. Um, it's not, it's not that much. So, okay, thank you. Okay. So, um, so, so basically, this is an example of a very easy to, to example to understand of one of the oldest problems that in, 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 in nanophysics I think of. It goes predates nanophysics, and that is a, a, a dipole over conducting plane. Okay, some people call this a Sommerfeld problem. And of course, if the if the dipole uh, radiator is a molecule, then we can sort of go back to the chance problem Silby and think about this problem in terms of a dipole over um, some extended conducting plane. In all of these cases, the parameter that was always varied 
was the distance between the dipole and the plane, right? We don't, can't almost not think about this problem unless it's the distance between the emitter and the ground plane. But let's do something completely different. If we change the problem entirely and we don't think about the distance, okay, and we think instead about changing the thickness of the film, now from a plasma point of view, that's very, very interesting because we now have actually a tunable plasma system. Okay? But we're tuning the plasma density of states of the surface plasmons by going from a thick film to a thin film. So even if we start with a, a <coughs> non tunable nanoparticle with localized plasma resonances, by changing the thickness of the film and keeping all these other parameters the same, we are, have introduced a certain new tunability into this system. And that's very important. It's an important way to think about this. So we're tuning T, okay, and not C, okay? Not Z for the first time, not Z. Okay. And what's also very interesting about this, now remember I mentioned that um, the, 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 the hybridization of localized resonances is isotropic to the Schrodinger equation. Now we're looking at the, in the interaction between localized resonances and resonances in a continuous band, right? So a continuous band of states. And this is, of course, uh, the, the, this is, of course, uh, very reminiscent of the Anderson model. And this, uh, the, the equations that describe this are, in fact, isomorphic to one variation of the Anderson model, which is called the, inter the spinless anderson fano model, which has been applied to a variety of other uh, topics in condensed matter physics. And now we have actually this, uh, this, this photonic analog for the Anderson model, where we can uh, begin to now see some interesting analogies, but in this very simple and very easily designable plasmonic system. And so uh, this illustrates precisely what I'm talking about here. It's a particle over a film, and here we're just varying uh, the thickness of the film. So here we have the localized resonances of the nanoparticle, and here we have the, de the, the, the surface plasma density of states. Okay, and there's a, as we tune the th and make the, the film thinner and thinner, then the states, of course, are changing in the surface plasmon, as are the actual states that are part of the interaction between the surface plasmon and the localized plasmon. And we tune through three uh, characteristic regimes of the Anderson model from uh, um, sort of as we go to, to, to thinner and thinner, to sort of a resonance regime, down to a regime um, that gives rise to low energy resonance, which is known in this um, particular community as virtual state. And so we can actually see virtual state resonances in plasmons as well due to the coupling of a nanoparticle with a very thin film. And this is shown here. These are the optical spectra that correspond to this interaction for all three regimes. And in particular, if we look at the, the, the thin film limit, we see this virtual state plasmon too disperses but quite strongly to low energies as a function of decreasing, uh, increasing and decreasing film thickness. And so, um, so we can do that experimentally really, really easily. Okay. You can just buy some colloids, put it on a very thin film with a, with a controlled spacer layer, and rather than seeing just the colloid resonance, now we see this beautiful well-defined resonance here. This well-defined resonance is the uh, is the hybridized resonance that um, the, the hybridized plasmon, due to the mixing between the localized plasmon and the propagating plasmons of the thin film. And even though this is a this is a slab FDTV calculation, but we can actually see the different resonances. This uh, high, highest energy mode is actually the slab plasmon, so this would correspond to this, the continuous surface plasmon. Um, and then here, at a little bit lower, is the actual nanoparticle plasmon resonance. And then lower yet are the two hybridized uh, resonances, which would fall into one continuous envelope if this was a continuous film and not and not a slab calculation. And so we can actually extend this to um, to to, uh, to other sorts of uh, geometries as well. Perhaps it's more interesting from a practical point of view to couple light into something like a nano wire. The nano wire is like a waveguide or any other sort of waveguide. So it's really really hard to couple light into plasma waveguides. Mark mentioned that earlier. Coupling efficiencies are atrocious, and we'd love to learn about ways in which we could enhance the coupling. So one way to do this is through this virtual state coupling by looking at the hybridization between a localized nanoparticle and a continuous nano wire. And I'm not going to go into the details here. But this is somewhat more um, somewhat more complex, but there are very strongly polarization dependent virtual states, and for certain polarizations. We're going to have this, the, the, the virtual state will be present, and for others it will be absent. And so we decided to look at this work experimentally. Um, we'll skip through skip through this just just to say that this is this is all the work of Peter Norlander, my theory collaborator, and, and Mark Stockman's collaborator as well. And, uh, have, and, and, and he was actually showing that one can in fact tweak the 
virtual, the, tweak the geometries of this problem, and the, that virtual state resonance can, in fact, give rise to enhanced coupling. So we'd love to see this experimentally, and so we can build a system of interacting nanoparticles with silver nanowires, and we can, uh, we can actually look at this system with, um, I didn't do this, my student did that. He's very proud of me. But, he, um, but I'm very proud of him because he started this experiment early January, and now he has some other beautiful results. Um, but this, these are uh, uh, nanowires where he has uh, he can uh, he can selectively illuminate, for example, a particle the particle wire junction, and he can see emission at both ends, or he can illuminate one end of the uh, wire, and he can see loop, he can see emission, very visible emission at the uh, particle wire junction, which is roughly as intense as what he sees here in Sumatra. We're off resonance in every case. Um, but he, he, he sees certainly a measurable emission at the, um, at the particle wire junction. It has a very nice, um, uh, pol very strong polarization dependence, which doesn't agree exactly what, with what we saw with theory, but these are slightly larger structures. We're out of the, 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 the far quasi-static limit in which the theory was conceived, and this is verified that as one rotates the polarization with respect to the particle and the particle with respect to the polarization. Then, in fact, what it seems um, that then one sees that this couple of this impact uh, uh, direct lots of it, uh, directly related to, um, to, to coupling into the, into the particle, uh, into the nanowire being the particle. If we just couple end on, we see exactly the kind of enhancement, polarization, dependence, um, um, anti and um, maximal related to what we would see if we tried to excite uh, plasmon directly on the nanowire. And then if we look at a more complex structure where we have one particle here, and then we look at the, at the in-coupling and out-coupling, in this particular case, we're illuminating here, and then we're looking at the relative efficiencies of lightning couples out here, and here, and here as well, we see that we can detect, uh, we, we can, we can um, excite the wire, and we can have output in all of the, these three different regions, and they all have some very interesting, well-defined phase relationship with each other, and so this is the and this is the subject of our, of our further work. But clearly, this is a practical mode. This is a completely unoptimized system. And so we can think about really looking at this to, to develop a, a combined a nanoparticle and extended systems and have very strong coupling between the two. So, um, so as Mark mentioned earlier, there is also, um, I just want to really briefly mention that this is useful for cancer therapy, since Mark mentioned it. And um, so, inst so instead of work, the, 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 the naturally <coughs> large um, extinction cross sections and the fact that plasmonic structures are non radiated gives rise to very, very strong photothermal heating effects, which can be really deleterious if you want to make sharp structures um, and don't do it carefully. Uh, but if you want to uh, destroy cells where you, you just place the nanoparticles next to cells, and then when you shine infrared light, <coughs> it's resonant with the nanoparticles, um, then you can actually. And infrared light is the light of choice because uh, infrared light passes directly through cells and tissue and it passes directly through blood. And so, um, so one can, in fact, uh, heat up the nanoparticles and they will destroy cells to which they are directly adjacent, as are, as are shown here in the simple cell culture. So if this plays, yes, oops, 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 oops. Okay, nope. Okay, very good. So this is an actual temperature gradient image of a tumor in a mouse that where nanoshells were injected and were radiated from this direction. So you can see the local photothermal heating that's built up here is a temperature map. And it turns out in this particular mouse tumor, there were some extraneous nanoshells injected back here. So you can see that the, that the heating is incredibly localized. It's just in the, in the microscale region where the nanoshells are embedded and that there's virtually no heating in the region in between. And, um, so, so these, can, these have been used in, in mouse trials now numerous times, and now there's a clinical study in cats um, where uh, nanoshells were injected into the bloodstream. They accumulate gradually into tumors, and after waiting several hours for the nanoshells to accumulate in the tumor, then the, nano, the, then the tumors were irradiated with near infrared light, and uh, for just uh, three minutes right through the skin, and after three minutes, and after a measurable temperature increase that would correspond to <coughs> then the tumor size was measured for 60 days. And although the tumors for all of, in, in, these, in, in the animal trials shown here and then in subsequent trials, although the tumor sizes for the nanoshell treated mice and the two control groups are the same on day zero of treatment by day 10, the, um, the, the nanoshell treated mice
mice had no tumors. They appeared to be in complete remission at day 10, while the two control groups had much larger tumors, which by, um, which, which, which as the study continued for two months, and by uh, the third week of the study, all of the control mice had tumors so large that they had to be sacrificed. But the, uh, the tumor-free mice stayed tumor-free for the rest of the study. And there is, as, as, as Mark actually mentioned earlier, working with gold is actually quite advantageous because it is chemically inert, and so it's non-toxic. Your body doesn't produce antigens, uh, excuse me, produce, produce, produce an antigenic response to, uh, in, in the presence of gold, as we all know. Um, and so, uh, so, so there are virtually no uh, toxic effects. So, so with that, I want to end and <coughs> What causes the uh, nanoshells to localize to the tumors? In this um, it's a detection? property of the tumor. And, and are so they derivatized with some molecule? That, that, that can be done and that has been done, but it turns out that um, particles as small as about 100 nanometers will accumulate naturally inside the tumor. Liposomes do exactly the same thing. So people have known about that for decades. They've used that for drug delivery. No, just a quick question regarding your enhancement emission study. <coughs> so your plasmon is broad, and your pump wavelength is very close to the emission wavelength. So I expect that enhancement is also <coughs> happening in the pump channel, and you are saying this 80-fold enhancement in the emission. How are you, are you sure that it's not coming from the pump channel, the enhancement in the emission? They're separate enough that we have very little overlap. So... There doesn't seem to be, there, there doesn't, uh, uh, of the two relative effects, emission is clearly the, clearly, clearly the stronger effect. I'm not going to say that that's not necessarily the case. In this particular experiment, we just see a very, very strong emission enhancement. There also could be geometry dependent factors related to that. Um, and I'm trying to ask a question that gives me an assessment of, of the enhancements that you see, the field enhancements. Basically, that assess how much of that is spatial and how much is temporal. One way of asking is, what's the cure for having to the form? So, 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 some of the enhancement is that light that's sort of left is still there, right, and superposing with other cycles of light. And some is because, of course, spatial, you've got a localization of all the, ra um, all the radiation that reached that local region is now focused and it's much smaller. <coughs> And one way to make that assessment is, again, if you have some idea of what the cue is, it's not about cavities. It's not about cavities. I mean, the only way we make cavities is about cavities, so... Well, but a nano shell is, you know, does that. It's not a cavity. It's not a cavity, but the when you form these yeah. resonances, I want to say this. So, it's certainly it's the case of diamonds, right? That's for sure the case. Right, there, you know, there's a... Essentially, if you looked at the field there, if you came in with a single cycle of pulse, you would you would find that if you looked at if you do your simulations, I think that you would see a field there that had multiple cycles. That's all that I'm asking. That I'm the number of cycles. Okay, that's a good definition. That's easy for us to do. And I don't have a, I, 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 these are. I don't have a good answer for that, and I, 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 you know, I shy away from some of the, um, I mean, th these are all very dynamic effects, and then we do all of our simulations with single cycle excitation, actually, so. Oh, then it should be, it should be there. You should have that. Right? Yes, but I don't have it in this yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think let's, let's continue these, perhaps at lunch.